So today we've got a treat. We've got three uh, phenomenal uh, speakers today. So our first, uh, I'll introduce Dr. Vera uh, Shreetharan, is an assistant professor of medicine and assistant professor of oncology at Mayo Clinic, where she is a non-malignant, let's see, she's non-malignant uh, classical hematologist. In addition to seeing patients clinically, she works in the Special Coagulation Laboratory. She is the benign hematology lead for Ask Mayo Expert and Internal Medicine Residency Hematology Rotation Director. Uh, our second uh, speaker uh, that I get to introduce this morning is Dr. Maria Wilrich. Uh, she is an Associate Professor of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology here at Mayo Clinic uh, College of Medicine and is the Co-Director in the Protein Immunology and the Clinical Mass Spectrometry Laboratory and Program Director of the Postdoctoral Clinical Chemistry Fellowship Program in DLNP. And then our third speaker that I get to introduce this morning is Dr. Ann Moyer. Uh, she is an associate professor of laboratory medicine and pathology, as well as assistant professor of pharmacology at the Mayo Clinic, where she is involved in clinical laboratory testing for pharmacogenomics, renal genetics, and genetic disorders of, the immune, de of immune deficiency and dysregulation. Great. Thank you so much for the wonderful intro introduction. So um, I'm Mira Shreeder, and I'm going to start off our discussion of complement testing in the diagnosis and management of thrombotic microangiopathy. Um, these are our learning objectives today. Um, so um, by the end of this talk, you'll be able to describe clinical diagnosis and management of complement-mediated TMAs, summarize testing modalities that guide diagnosis and management of complement-mediated TMAs, and recognize the utility of genetic testing in the setting of complement-mediated um, TMAs. So um, to start off with, um, what exactly is a thrombotic microangiopathy or TMA? So a TMA is a clinical pathologic syndrome characterized by thrombocytopenia or low platelets, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and end organ damage. So if you look at this picture here, um, this uh, picture here is supposed to demonstrate a normal blood vessel. And in a normal blood vessel, you have red blood cells and platelets and white blood cells, and they can circulate nicely, and the red cells can go oxygenate the end organ end organs, such as the kidneys. Um, in thrombotic mangerangiopathy, what happens is there's some type of endothelial damage, and that endothelial damage induces microthrombi formation. So then what happens in when, re was when red blood cells are circulating in the blood vessels, they reach that area of microthrombi formation, there's increased vascular resistance, and instead of flowing nicely through to the end, um, end organ, they're kind of obstructed and they, and they can't get to their organ to oxygenate them. Um, in addition, um, because of that obstruction, and the red cells are sheared or broken open, and that's what causes the hemolysis. So clinically, I'm suspecting this disorder when I have a patient that has low platelets, has a hemolytic anemia, and that hemolytic anemia has to be non-immune. So um, when we do like the Coombs testing, that testing would be negative. But also um, what I'm seeing is when I do a peripheral smear, I see the schistocytes, and I'm seeing that because of the red cells breaking when these cells reach an area of um, microthrombi formation. Um, the other time I'm sus suspecting a thrombotic microangiopathy is if I order a kidney biopsy and the kidney biopsy actually has pathologic findings of a thrombotic microangiopathy. So it's important to recognize that thrombotic microangiopathies are a heterogeneous group of disorders. And the slide here just demonstrates the broad differential diagnoses of things that can cause a thrombotic microangiopathy. I think one of the more commonly discussed thrombotic microangiopathies is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, or TTP, and this is due to ADAMTS13 deficiency. Another commonly um, discussed thrombotic microangiopathy is typical hemolytic uremic syndrome, and that's due to the presence of shigatoxin in the stool. Oftentimes, patients will present with a bloody diarrhea um, syndrome prodrome beforehand. But thrombotic microangiopathies can also occur due to other um, um, dis illnesses outlined here. Um, rheumatologic disorders like lupus or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome can cause a thrombotic microangiopathy. Certain medications, um, for example, gemcitabine or calcineurin inhibitors can cause a thrombotic microangiopathy. Thrombotic microangiopathies can also occur due to uh, malignancy um, or malignant hypertension. Um, but what we're here to talk about today is not any of those, but rather thrombotic microangiopathy due to complement dysregulation or complement-mediated TMA. 
So um, before um, moving on in the discussion, it's important to recognize um, that primary complement media TMA um, is due to um, alternative act, act activity um, complement dysregulation. And this um, dysregulation um, is due to um, genetics or antibodies that are there inducing um, this alternative pathway dysregulation. What makes it a little confusing is that um, complement TMA can also occur secondary to other secondary conditions. And so that's what is outlined in this box here. Um, so these are thrombotic microangiopathies that are occurring due to these secondary conditions, but there's a um, complement amplified component that's making it happen. So it's not considered to be a primary disorder. What we're gonna focus on today is when this thrombotic microangiopathy is considered to be a primary alternative pathway defect causing the thrombotic microangiopathy. Um, the terminology for this disorder used to be called atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome, but now we're uh, moving towards um, calling it complement mediated thrombotic microangiopathy. So complement-mediated thrombotic microangiopathy is a very rare disorder. It has an annual incidence of about one to two cases per million. In terms of how patients present, um, usually um, um, it can occur in either children or in adults, but when, when it's occurring in adults, usually it's occurring in females. Um, one of the profound clinical manifestations of atypical HUS or complement-mediated TMA is that patients will present with really bad renal function, and oftentimes um, these patients will need dialysis. And if they don't get appropriate treatment for the thrombotic microangiopathy, oftentimes they're going to need um, a kidney transplant. In addition to the renal manifestations, patients can also have extra renal manifestations in about 20% of cases. Um, some of these extra renal manifestations include um, central nervous system manifestations, such as seizures or strokes, um, or they can have gastrointestinal manifestations like diarrhea, abdominal pain. So let's talk a little bit about why someone would develop um, primary um, complement media TMA or atypical HUS. So atypical HUS is due to the dysregulation of the alternative pathway of complement. Um, this cartoon here is a very simplistic view of the alternative pathway of complement, but essentially what happens in this pathway, is there's continuous hydrolysis of C3 that leads to the formation of C3BB, which provides an amplification loop back to the C3 convertase. Um, without appropriate regulation of this loop, you have um, increased deleterious action because you have um, increased um, SMAC formation on the endothelium, and this causes the endothelial damage and the microthrombi formation. So the complement system has its own checks and balances, and some of the regulatory proteins in the alternative pathway of complement are um, outlined in the slide here. For example, um, CFH can bind to um, CFB um, and uh, bind C3B. CFH can also bind to glycosaminoglycans on the endothelial surface. MCP can also act as a cofactor, so for CFI-mediated cleavage of C3B to generate inactivated C3B. But what happens in atypical HUS or primary complement-mediated TMA is that there's some type of abnormality in these regulators, and um, this abnormality often manifests as a genetic variant. Um, in about 50% of patients, they're identified as having um, genetic variants in either um, uh, proteins that can cause loss of function or proteins that can cause gain of function. And these are outlined here, and um, Dr. Moya will go to this in more detail during her portion of the talk. So now that you have a general idea of what causes a complement-mediated TMA, how do we actually make the diagnosis? So unfortunately, the diagnosis of thrombotic microangiopathy or complement-mediated thrombotic microangiopathy is a tricky one. And so to kind of outline how we would do it um, in a clinical aspect, I thought I'd present a case. So this case is a 64-year-old female with no significant past medical history who, who presented to the hospital for confusion, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. Lab evaluation um, at presentation demonstrated anemia, so a hemoglobin of 5.7, thrombocytopenia with platelets of 64,000, um, end organ damage with a creatinine of 5.4. The anemia was further evaluated, and it was uh, demonstrated to be a hemolytic anemia with increased LDH, decreased haptoglobin, and increase, increased indirect bilirubin. This anemia was Coombs negative, meaning the DAT was negative. And then when we asked for the peripheral smear, the peripheral sh smear showed schistocytes. So overall, this clinical picture was very consistent with a thrombotic microangiopathy. So whenever I see a patient with a thrombotic microangiopathy, I go to this big differential and I say, okay, what could be causing it? 
And that kind of leads me to the first point of how we diagnose a complement-mediated TMA. The first criteria is that we have to exclude other uh, potential causes of the thrombotic microangiopathy. Um, there's not a pathognomonic test that we can say we ordered this and this for sure says this is a complement-mediated TMA. It's more of a diagnosis of exclusion. When thinking about thrombotic microangiopathies and thinking about ones that need urgent um, evaluations um, versus ones that we can wait maybe a little bit longer, um, disorders like TTP are ones that we absolutely want to exclude. And so we order an Adam TS13. Um, we can exclude other um, diagnoses by the way patients present. So if a person presents with bloody diarrhea or a history of bloody diarrhea, then we're considering typical HUS or M due to the presence of Shiga toxin. Um, so I'm going to go back to this case. Um, and so um, in this, uh, for this case here, um, the patient didn't really have any of these other secondary conditions. Um, what we checked was we checked an Adam TS-13, um, and that was normal. Um, so it suggested to us that this was not TTP. So then, then um, going back to this other picture here, some of the other criteria we use to make a diagnosis of complementary TMA is we take into account complement serology and complement genetic testing. These both have supportive roles, but they not but they not cannot be like um, the only diagnostic criteria that we look at. So going back to this um, differential diagnosis, the patient did not have TTP. She didn't have any secondary history to consider these diagnoses. So clinically, from the clinical side, I was strongly considering complement mediated TMA. And so with that, I'm going to um, hand the presentation over to Dr. Moyer and Dr. Wilrich to continue the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Sridram. So I am in the laboratory that performs the serology testing for complement. I'm a consultant in that laboratory, the protein immunology lab. So um, we were talking about complement, and you had an idea already of how the alternative pathway works. Uh, we have the complement system, we have an overview, and there are three main pathways, the classical pathway, the lactin pathway, and the alternative pathway, which is the main focus of the talk. They have different initiation molecules, and the different pathways recognize different triggers. So an antibody antigen immune complex triggers the classical pathway. The lactin pathway is triggered by pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And the alternative pathway, whenever it finds a virus, a fungi, lipopolysaccharides, cobra venom, it, uh, it gets triggered. And it's always active at low levels in a surveillance role. The molecules that are different for each pathway are C1Q in the classical pathway, the mantles binding lactin or phycolins in the lactin pathway, and as I said, the C3 spontaneously hydrolyzes in the alternative pathway. And there is a point where all the pathways converge to amplify their signal. Once that initial C3 was cleaved, for instance, in the, C in the alternative pathway, more C3 needs to be called to action to amplify that signal. So eventually the convertases, the C3 convertase targets more cleavage of C3 and the C5 convertase uh, starts trying to cleave C5. And there are different, uh, different convertase systems for each of the pathways, but they have the same function. And the main effects of complement are threefold. Um, the most visible, the most noticeable one is the cell lysis with the formation of the membrane attack complex, which is a fragment of C5, C6, 7, 8, 9. And then we have a lot of inflammation generated with the production of anaphylotoxins. So fragments of C3 and C5 are the most potent ones there. And we also have opsonization with a fragment of C3 specifically being tagged on the surface of cells to generate uh, opsonization or to facilitate phagocytosis. So this, again, a very simplified view. You got a real complex view in the title slide of what the complement cascades look like. And in the clinical lab, we have over 30 assays to measure that entire cascade. And the main indications for testing are systemic glucose erythematosus, a suspected primary immunodeficiency, hereditary angioedema, and at last but not least, the focus of our talk today, thrombotic microangiopathies. 
And we offer four main types of tests for complement that will give you a snapshot of what's going on in that patient specimen today. So we can measure complement function, and those assays are traditionally called CH50, AH50, mannose binding lactin function. We can measure component concentrations, and these are the most commonly tested uh, analytes for complement. Where, wherever you go in every lab, they can measure C3 and C4. And we also measure more specialized um, fragments of the cascade, so the split products or activation fragments, and autoantibodies against complement factors. We also have that as an offering in the laboratory. So it can be complicated. What do we order for uh, thrombotic microangiopathy studies? So the laboratory developed a panel uh, that was led by Dr. David Murray, one of my colleagues, when I was about to join the lab in 2014. And we created a panel with nine different analytes. And here we are measuring classical pathway, alternative pathway, and terminal pathway, and regulator components of the classical pathway. And you can see here that we have serum samples, we have citrate plasma samples, and I'm going to discuss that in a little bit of detail. And I said that this was a panel to analyze the alternative pathway. So why do we have classical pathway here as well? And this was important to help us understand if it's exclusively the alternative pathway that's being affected, or if we have a more global complement activation that's also involving the classical pathway. And we see that in cases of infection, autoimmune disease, trauma, when we have overall complement amplification. And that's important to differentiate and to give us an idea who, which pathway is the most involved here. So let's review this panel in a figure format. What exactly are we measuring? What parts of the pathway are we measuring? We are assessing classical pathway function, alternative pathway function, a couple of the regulators with factor H measurement, for instance. We're measuring component concentrations for each one representative from each of the pathways, and then a central component. And then we're measuring activation fragments at the end. So breakdown products of these initial parent fragments are being measured at the end. And in a textbook, uh, textbook case of a thrombotic microangiopathy that's mediated by complement, what we expect is to have overactivation of the alternative pathway. And that means that we would not have enough of the parent intact components of complement to replicate this uh, cascade in vitro. So we would expect to see low overall function result of the alternative pathway. You could have low regulators that are not uh, present in enough concentration to do their job. And eventually you can have depletion of C3 since it's the central component of the pathway. And um, a final confirmation is that um, the activation products would be accumulating towards the end. And if C3, which is the most abundant complement component protein, uh, if that is decreased, then of, uh, likely it affects the CH50 test as well, which also needs C3 to proceed and, and uh, continue carry on the cascade. And the classical pathway should remain unaltered, like not altered at all if we have a, a disease that's being mediated exclusively by the alternative pathway. And then what about these functional tests that I'm talking about? So specifically the classical pathway function or alternative pathway function. What do I want the audience to take away from, from these tests? Well, I want you to be reminded that complement is the heat labile fraction of our immune system. And that to carry on that entire cascade, we need the components to be intact. And the goal of this testing is to replicate the specific pathway from beginning to end. And most of the tests will rely on the most visible effect of complement, which is the cell lysis. Um, this is a difficult test to collect. It's one of the frequent redraw requests that we have in the department. And uh, we require samples to be frozen within two hours of collection. They should be kept refrigerated during the, even the clotting time. And best stability is observed at minus 80, but we can't expect all our customers or all, all our clients to have minus 80 freezers. So we do recommend sending the samples frozen at minus 20 to us. 
And the most common uh, functional tests are the old hemolytic assays where we are trying to trigger cell lysis. So we are trying to visualize that by using animal cells, uh, animal red blood cells, I'm sorry. And the CH50, CH50 stands for classical pathway. Uh, so what's the amount of cells that can cleave? What's the amount of complement needed to cleave 50% of those animal cells that we are using of the sheep red blood cells here? And similarly, the alternative pathway uses specific buffers to block the classical pathway. But ultimately, the readout of this test is the same for both classical and alternative pathway activity, where you're measuring the formation of that final membrane attack complex formed by C5B, C6, 7, 8, 9, and how much of it uh, is formed to cleave 50% of the cells. And gladly, these assays have been uh, replaced, at least a lot of them in the US, by more automated immunoassays that have uh, better lots of lots. You can imagine that getting different lots of rabbit, red blood cells uh, make quality control very difficult in the laboratory. So we also have ELISA assays that rely on the formation of the MAC and an epitope towards the end, a new epitope that's formed only when the MAC is assembled to detect that complement activity. And the, the assays then block the other pathways by using specific dilutions um, or having you know, specific, um, specific coding on the plates to trigger that pathway. And, but the final outcome, the final readout is the same. So these are the functional assays that require the cascade to progress. And then the activation fragments that I mentioned, they are the opposite. We require plasma and um, we require uh, that because we want that snapshot of what's going on in vivo. We want to prevent the cascade from continuing to progress in vitro post blood draw, and we know that even clotting is associated with complement activation. And then for measurement of these analytes, we need uh, plasma. So we need a chelating agent to walk, uh, to chelate magnesium and calcium and prevent the cascade from progressing. That's why we need that paired specimen type, you know, plasma and serum for the entire panel. And we offer a few uh, of these activation fragments uh, in our panel here that I highlighted with an asterisk. And the other complement tests that we offer are to measure component concentrations uh, and autoantibodies. And we can use a variety of immunoassays, nephilometry, turbidimetry for measurement of those. The most um, tricky ones are the, the functional where you need the cascade to progress and the split products where you need to freeze the cascade so it does not progress anymore. For the components, it can be either or. You just need to know the specifics of your assay. So when we, when, we did, when we decided to test the performance of our panel of nine analytes in this very rare disease, we had 10 cases that were clinically confirmed complement-mediated thrombotic microangiopathies at the time. And you can see that the abnormalities that we identify in the panel are not always the same. So we really need that entire, you know, in, in red here, you can see the test results that were outside the reference intervals. And we have a variety of tests uh, being abnormal. And uh, it's, not, it's not easy to find out a specific biomarker, as Dr. Shiram said, that could be responsible. If you have this abnormality, this will definitely be complement-mediated TMA. So the panel helps us make that overall interpretation. And when we reviewed this, we understood that, well, if we have uh, four tests or more being abnormal. We have a 50% uh, you know, prevalence there in that case, 50% of the cases had that. Uh, so we managed to have a 100% sensitivity approach because at, in all those 10 cases, at least one parameter of the panel was abnormal. But when we compare that to all those other TMAs, the 34 other types of thrombotic microangiopathies, we understood that we had a very low specificity uh, by saying that, okay, any abnormality would be complement-mediated TMA. We, that's very low specificity to say that. 
So we also tried in that study to identify what would be the best balance between sensitivity and specificity. And we were able to achieve a diagnostic odds ratio of 24 if you had this combination of low CH50 and low factor P. But this is very hard to manage and understand in, in clinical practice. And that's why we interpret every single one of the panels. Uh, Dr. Murray and I are always on sign outs. And I, I suspect that if we include more cases, these numbers could change over time. And then last but not least, I mentioned about um, factor H antibodies. They were not originally included in the panel. And factor H is a regulator of the cascade and it competes for factor B. So it's an inhibitor of the cascade. And here it's binding to glycosamine glycan uh, residues on the surface of host cells. And it's trying to protect that cell from further damage from complement. So for instance, a C3B fragment got deposited on that, sorry, on that um, host cell. And factor H is here, uh, you know, saying that this is a self cell, that this is a host cell, and it should not be further damaged by complement. If you have antibodies to factor H that prevent that binding to the glycosamine glycans, the C3B uh, will continue to be tagged there, and that may promote uh, activity from complement with the membrane attack complex so, it, complex, so it could promote cell lysis here, and the cell could also be uh, phagocytosed as well. So antibodies to factor H can cause complement-mediated TMA, and they are associated with a disease onset uh, in, in children specifically between 5 and 15 years old, severe illness and extra renal features, and the appearance of these autoantibodies is associated with a deletion of complement factor H-related protein 1 in over 80% of cases. And about 5 to 13% of AHAS cases have an, a factor H antibody. And depending on the cohorts that was used in South Asia, apparently 50% of the AHAS cases have a factor H antibody. And this is one of the most standardized assays for complement around the world. And most of Europe uses a reference material from a, a specific patient. And they were attributed a value of 2,000 units per mil. And then every lab, over 25 labs across Europe, use that same material to develop their own test. We had access to that material, but it wasn't enough to fully validate our test. Uh, but we do have an ELISA lab developed test to measure antibodies to factor H, and we went live last year. And you can see how rare this disorder is and testing for such a complex, um, you know, an esoteric test or analyte would be. We performed 336 tests in one year, and only 12 of these results were positive uh, so far. We know we match uh, the European laboratories by performing proficiency testing studies. And I think there are only uh, three places in the United States that perform this testing that adds to our complement mediated TMA supportive criteria. So I will stop here and I will pass on to Dr. Moyer now and we can continue. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dr. Willerich. So I'll continue on our relay of complement testing and uh, cover the area of genetic testing, which is my favorite part. So in general, our best estimate is probably about half of cases have what at least a known genetic etiology. It's possible that there are other genes that are associated that we just aren't familiar with yet, haven't identified. But again, this is our best estimate at this point in time. And so there are a lot of different benefits of establishing a genetic diagnosis or performing genetic testing for complement-mediated thrombotic microangiopathies, or I'll generally call them AHUS because that's a little easier to say. Uh, so one of the uh, benefits is that you can sometimes get a little bit of a sense of the disease course. So the genotype-phenotype correlations aren't perfect, but there are some genetic variants and some genes that are thought to lead to perhaps a little bit milder course versus others that might be a little earlier onset or a little more severe. Uh, it also can be very useful in evaluating the recurrence risk. 
And this can also aid in treatment decisions, and you'll hear about it a little bit more later, but particularly eculizumab, which is used for treatment, and whether you need to continue that for life or have an opportunity to discontinue it. And another thing that's kind of exciting is that there are a couple of genetic variants that have been identified that are highly associated with resistance to anti-complement therapy. And even though this gene isn't one that is necessarily needed for diagnosis, it's definitely pretty easy to add it into your genetic test. And the variants are very rare, but if somebody had the one, it would be really good to know that maybe they aren't going to respond to the drugs very well. So with that, what genes are all involved? So on the right, I've given you a graph that shows approximate uh, case, percentage of cases for the patients that we know the genetic cause and what percentage of those cases are explained by each of the genes that we look at. And again, about half of cases, we just really don't have a genetic understanding of what's going on. Uh, but some of these genes can have gain of function genetic variants, and these generally would be activating complements, so C3 and CFB. And then there are a number of different complement regulators, and we can have loss of function in some of those. And then in addition, there are some genes that are not necessarily part of the complement system, but maybe more tied into the coagulation system or vitamin B12 metabolism. And so we include these on our panel as well. And we also do include ADAMTS13, which would be in the differential diagnosis. So the thing that's really I think both fascinating and tricky is that it's difficult to fully understand the genetics because they're very complex. So some patients will just have one variant in a gene like CFH, for example. And so maybe it looks like perhaps an autosomal dominant type of inheritance pattern. And in some cases, there might be multiple family members that are impacted, but often that's not the case. Uh, we can also see patients that might have what looks like an autosomal recessive type of presentation where both of the two alleles inherited one from each parent would have a genetic variant that would be pathogenic. And so some of these differences can lead to different disease presentations. So when we see these biallelic variants in CFH or CD46, which is also known as MCP, so you probably saw that featured in some of the earlier slides. Uh, well, at any rate, some of these patients may present a little bit earlier. And so in general, we tend to think of a lot of genetic disorders as being classic Mendelian disorders where we've got a nice clear autosomal dominant or autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. Well, the complement genetics don't really work nice and cleanly like that. So we consider them to not necessarily be Mendelian because there are also many other variables that may also play a role. And we'll get into that in this section. The other thing I wanted to point out is that there are several other disorders that can have genetic overlap with AHUS. So C3 uh, glomerulopathy and age-related macular degeneration in particular. Uh, so CFH tends to be a key feature in all of these disorders as well as some of the other genes. So for today, I'm going to focus on CFH because I think I could talk about complement genetics for multiple hours, and I don't think that's what anybody is signed up for for today. So we'll just focus on CFH. This was about 25% of the cases, so the most common. And again, patients can either have a heterozygous variant or uh, biallelic, so compound heterozygous or homozygous. And what actually happens is you end up with a dysfunctional protein, and it can either alter its ability to bind to some of the glycosaminoglycan and sialic acid and C3B that you heard about in the previous slides, or it could potentially impact uh, other aspects of its regulatory ability. So when patients have genetic variants in CFH, we know that they have an increased risk of recurrence, and it really depends on which study you look at as to what exactly that recurrence risk is. But it's not just the recurrence of the disorder itself, but even after somebody has had a renal transplant, there's a high risk of recurrence even at that point in time if they don't continue to have uh, treatment after they've gotten that new kidney. It's a little bit difficult to look at the nice genotype-phenotype correlation between the genetic variants and the plasma ranges that Dr. Willerich was just showing you because the normal range for plasma factor H tends to be fairly large and it's influenced by multiple other factors beyond just the genetic variants. So if you had a patient with a heterozygous variant, perhaps some of them would end up being a little bit low for factor H and some of them might actually end up just in the lower end of the normal range. But the part that I really want to focus on is that CFH ends up being a really interesting gene because there's a lot of homology with additional family members of this gene that are called the CFH-related protein genes. And it doesn't necessarily meet, translate entirely into what's going on with the patient, but at the very least, it ends up adding a lot of complexity to our testing. And I think we're learning more and more every day about what this might actually mean clinically as well. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. <laughs> 
So at the top, I've got the CFH gene, and each little box is one of the exons. And then you can see CFHR1 through 5 genes uh, similarly depicted. And how these are colored is based on homology. So what I really want you to look at here is CFH exons 20 through 22 are very highly homologous or very similar to the genetic sequence of CFHR1 exons 4 through 6. And you can see other areas of homology throughout this gene family as well. But with CFH, if we think that we're going to be testing this gene, it's really important to know if the genetic variants that we identify, it perhaps in this exon 21, are they really in CFH exon 21, or are they actually in CFHR1 exon 5? Because of that degree of homology, it makes it difficult to sort that out using the short read next generation sequencing chemistry that is our, our usual uh, method for most of our testing today. So the other thing that a lot of laboratories have done is we know that deletions and duplications can be really important as well. So many labs use a technique called MLPA, and it has probes where all of these triangles are. And so those are the exons that you would be able to see a deletion or a duplication in, but it's yet another technology. And in laboratory testing, if you have to add multiple techniques together, it ends up making your testing cost a bit more. So we've got the two problems of being able to sort out deletions and duplications, and then where the actual um, sequence variants are in these genes as well. So in our laboratory, we had some very creative development technologists that came up with a very creative solution to sorting out how do I know if the genetic variant is one of in one of these exons versus one of these. So every place that you see a dotted line underneath of some exons, and you'll see them for areas of homology, uh, Basically, we ended up having a long range PCR reaction that we perform in addition to our regular next generation sequencing. And I'll show you how that looks on the next slide. So normally our capture based next generation sequencing, we wouldn't be able to map our reads correctly. So we wouldn't know if the genetic variant was really in CFH or CFHR1 because of this homology. So that's why you see this red and blue all intermixed. But if you perform the specific amplicon for just CFH and not for CFHR1, then you can still do next generation sequencing, but using an entirely different process where we're using a very specialized reference file where we've actually removed the CFHR1 gene. And this forces the reads to map to CFH. And we know that this is okay because the technologists that we're working on developing this assay use very specific primers so that we're isolating just the gene that we're interested in. And so we can use, utilize this approach throughout this whole gene family and uh, basically pool all those amplicons together and it'll allows us to do is testing that really wouldn't have been easy to do not too long ago and would have normally required a lot of Sanger sequencing, which gets to be very expensive. So as such, we're really learning a lot more about the CFH and CFHR locus. And so we'll go back to what we've known for a little while and then talk a little bit more about some of the things that are more complex. So as you heard, deletion of CFHR1 is something that can lead to factor H autoantibodies. And we know that deletion of both CFHR1 and CFHR3 is actually really quite common in the general population. So some of you that are listening may actually have this deletion, and some of us may even have a homozygous deletion. So some populations of the world tend to not have these deletions as commonly, whereas other populations, there are about 33% of people walking around in Nigeria, perfectly healthy, who don't have these genes. And so they may be at risk for these autoantibodies, but what's interesting is certainly not all people with the homozygous deletion end up developing the factor H autoantibodies. And there are some people who have these autoantibodies and do not have the CFHR1 deletion. So we really don't totally know the mechanism of how this works right now, but it's very nice that we're able to do the anti-factor H autoantibody testing here at Mayo in Dr. Willard's lab. So along these same lines, just to reemphasize this point, so the anti-factor H antibodies are very common in AHUS cases in India, but interestingly in that population, their homozygous deletion frequency is lower than it is in some other populations of the world that uh, may not or may also have these anti-factor H antibodies. So again, the correlation, it's just not perfect and something that I think would be interesting to get a better understanding of how that works. But in addition to the CFHR1 deletions that we see fairly commonly, there are a lot of other deletions and duplications and hybrid alleles that have been described in both AHUS and also the C3 uh, glomerulopathy that I mentioned has genetic overlap. But a lot of them are very rare 
And at this point, they're not very well characterized. And a lot of the reason for that is because we couldn't do this testing and couldn't detect them outside of a research setting until recently. So the more we've got these advances that allows us to bring this technology into the clinical laboratories, the more patients we're testing and the more we end up seeing these different variants and hopefully we'll be able to get a better understanding of them over time. So here's just that CFH and CFHR 1 through 5 locus and their actual arrangement here. And all of the red bars that you can see are deletions and the green bars are duplications and it corresponds to what's gone. So in this case, the CFHR 3 and CFHR 1 uh, deletion corresponding to this bar. But you can see that there are many of them and some of them are relatively rare. But what I meant by hybrid alleles is sometimes you'll have most of the CFH gene, but then part of it will be missing. And instead you'll have part of CFHR 3 or part of CFHR 1. So I think it's really exciting that we're able to identify more of these. And there's a lot of research going on in this space as well. So this diagram actually comes from a nice review that just came out earlier this year. So I think we're going to learn more about these deletions and duplications and more to come over time. So the complexity in general goes beyond just factor H, so H though. So as I mentioned, this isn't really exactly a Mendelian disorder. We know that there's incomplete penetrance. So that means that not everybody that has a pathogenic variant will actually go on to develop disease. And so we think the penetrance tends to be maybe around 50%. Again, it depends a little bit on which study you read. And some of the genes are thought to have higher or lower penetrance, but it's something that's uh, definitely incomplete penetrance. And the, what's been noted, though, is that a lot of times the affected individuals who have the pathogenic variant tend to have additional susceptibility factors that perhaps their family members who are healthy do not have. And so that's something that's really interesting that we need to get a better understanding of here, too. So in addition to talking about patients having a heterozygous variant or homozygous, there's actually about 10% of patients who are affected have variants in multiple genes. So it's possible that there could be some sort of additive effect of these multiple genetic variants that could be impacting penetrance or severity. And the thing that I think is really fascinating, there's also some risk variants or haplotypes that are common in the general population. And we don't think that they cause disease on their own, but perhaps they could be interacting with some other variables or particularly patients who have pathogenic variants. These could be what tips them towards actually uh, manifesting disease. So here's an example where we're looking at CFH and then again, that CFHR family. And this H3 haplotype uh, actually confers a risk of AHUS. And in some cases, some of these haplotypes are actually protective against some of the other disorders that are out of scope today too. And in addition, there's a CD46 or an MCP risk haplotype. For the CFH haplotype, it's associated with slightly lower factor H levels, so perhaps that's the mechanism, but it's basically enriched in the patients who have disease over the patients who don't. But again, 16% of controls having this risk haplotype, clearly there's more to the story than just having this haplotype. So in general, these are both very common in the general population, so it's really unclear what it means if the patient doesn't have a rare pathogenic variant or perhaps some other trigger. So in general, the genetic testing for AHUS, there are multiple different options. Historically, it was really just single genes doing Sanger sequencing. They're still available, but really not very cost effective. Uh, the targeted panels are what we offer here at Mayo. We've got one targeted panel, and I would say that this is the best testing approach right now for AHUS, and this is because we can look at multiple genes at the same time. We can also include other genes that are in the differential diagnosis, and by based on your panel design, you could potentially also choose to include the risk haplotypes and variants like we have here. And in general, if your laboratory is offering a targeted panel, you're expecting people to send in cases for this indication and therefore have expertise in interpreting them. The exomes and genomes are a possibility, and this might be a way we can eventually uncover additional variants that are associated, but in many cases, these won't be able to include those highly homologous genes or technically challenging areas. They won't include the risk haplotypes as well, and in general, you may find a lot more secondary and unintended findings, and they tend to be a little more expensive than the targeted panels. And then the one that we get questions about a lot that I always kind of have to think about is the known variants or the familial testing. So you found a patient who has a you've got a pathogenic variant, do you want to test the rest of the family members to see if they have the same variant? We do that commonly in hereditary disorders, but I think it's a little tricky here because even if the family members have the same variant, 
they may or may not ever go on to develop AHAS. And so it might be important to think about, do they have the risk haplotypes too? So it's a little more complex than just that one pathogenic variant, but this could be potentially useful if looking at donors to maybe uh, be able to donate a kidney. Maybe you wouldn't want to use someone with the same variant if you know that there's a pathogenic variant out there. So it's used a little bit more with caution. So mostly the targeted panel. And in general, how we interpret genetic variants today is we follow some guidelines that have been published, but these are really designed for inherited Mendelian disorders. So we have to use them with a bit of a grain of salt and some caution for this particular disorder that isn't exactly Mendelian, and where we know that there's potentially contribution from the environment as well as potentially multiple genes. So what these normally look at in these guidelines is multiple different variables, and you put together all of that information to decide whether you think that variant is pathogenic, likely pathogenic, in uncertain significance, likely benign or benign, and what we report are the ones that we consider uncertain significance, likely pathogenic or pathogenic today. But where it's a little bit tricky for this particular disorder is some of these genes or some of these specific variants may end up having a little bit higher minor allele frequency, or they might be a little more common in the general population than you would expect for a very rare disorder because we know the penetrance is low and that there's other variables that are at play. It's a little bit difficult to look at previous reports of variants in cases or segregation within a family. So who has the disease and the variant or who might have the variant and not have disease? Because again, with the penetrance being a little bit lower, it makes it a little more complicated to understand what's going on and use that type of data. Uh, it's really nice to have disease specific and population databases because then you can get a better sense of whether the genetic variant you're seeing in this patient is more common in people with disease versus people who are walking around healthy. But for these databases to be very useful, it's good for them to be very inclusive of many different world populations. And I think at the end of the day, the thing that ends up being really important here is at, once we've classified the variant, uh, we do use some patient clinical features and family history that get tied into the, the classification criteria. But even if we end up calling it a variant of uncertain significance, going back and thinking about the clinical context, what are those other laboratory tests that are performed in Dr. Wilrich's lab? And so I think this is where Dr. Schrederan has a, a bit of a challenge to pull together all of the pieces of information to really understand what's going on for that particular patient. So in summary, I think the genetic testing is a very useful tool. It's being ordered more frequently, so hopefully it's helping everybody. But at the end of the day, it may not always provide a definitive answer for all of the patients. The testing is typically next generation sequencing based today, but in many cases, additional techniques are required to fill in some of those gaps due to some of the homology, like I showed you with factor H. The interpretation is definitely complex for this disorder and requires specialized expertise. And again, that's in part due to the in incomplete penetrance, the risk haplotypes, and knowing that they're environmental components as well. Uh, it'd be really nice if we could do more genotype phenotype correlations to get a better understanding about certain genes and what type of presentation you might expect. But really, I still think pulling together all of the pieces is just essential for this disorder. And the last thing I wanted to mention is just to put in a plug that if you ever were ordering this test or had a patient and you've got questions about the genetic testing, definitely give us a call. We love talking about our tests in the laboratory. And as mentioned earlier, the CAP TMA group here at Mayo is a fantastic forum for case discussion. And I always enjoy being able to hear what everybody's thinking from all their different areas of expertise. And with that, I think I'm gonna pass it back off. Okay, great. Um, so now that we've had a chance to um, hear about what lab testing um, can add to the patient's case, I wanted to go back to the patient case. So um, the patient's complement serology is outlined here. Um, so she had an elevated BB, a low factor AH, and an elevated SMAX. So overall, this was consistent for um, activation of the alternative pathway. Her complement genetics showed a variant of unknown significance in CFH. So putting that all together, um, clinically, so I already thought she clinically had, you know, a likely diagnosis of complement mediated TMA because she didn't have TPP and there were no other secondary conditions I could identify. I, that, I then use that complement genetic testing and serologic testing to help solidify that diagnosis. So serolog serologically, she did have alternative pathway activation um, and she had a variant of unknown significance in CFH. So overall, I um, considered her to have complement mediated TMA. So how do we treat complement-mediated TMA? 
So for those of you who are familiar with thrombotic microangiopathies and TTP, the cornerstone of treatment has been plasma exchange. Um, but for complemented TMA, the actual definitive treatment is complement inhibition. You may be wondering what, what does plasma exchange do in this disorder? And so a lot of patients with AHUS have been started on plasma exchange because we're still ruling out TTP. And so we've come to learn that although some patients have a response, usually that response is usually in only in the hematologic parameters, and it only occurs in about 30 to 80% of patients. Um, and it's really dependent on what their nature of the um, underlying complement abnormality is. A plasma exchange alone will not improve the creatinine and will not usually improve the LDH to a remarkable um, um, amount, and so you have to use complement inhibition. What we have available for complement inhibition today are two medications. The first medication that was approved is, is echolizumab. Um, echolizumab is a, is a C5 inhibitor. Um, and ravaluzumab was approved in 2019. It's also a C5 inhibitor, but it has a longer half-life. Um, both of these medications inhibit progression of TMA, lead to renal recovery over time, and are effective in, in preventing recurrence. So one of the biggest um, discussions um, regarding treatment for this topic right now is how long do you continue the C5 inhibitor therapy? Um, there's no consensus, um, and we do know that relapses occur after discontinuation. So the three general approaches uh, that we have right now are outlined on the slide. What I'm going to focus on more now is complement inhibitor discontinuation. Um, before complement inhibitor therapy was available for atypical HUS, we knew that relapse rates um, were about 40% and most occurred in the first year presentation. Since the initiation of ecoluzumab and ravaluzumab in the treatment paradigm, there has been several case series and prospective observational studies that have demonstrated that some patients can discontinue ecoluzumab successfully. Um, and we're learning that the presence of certain mutations may increase the risk of recurrence. Um, mutations in CFH or C3 are thought to be higher risk for a risk of relapse, whereas patients with no um, variant or um, homozygous CFHR3 um, one deletions are at lower risk for relapse. Our group recently evaluated um, this um, with this um, systematic review that assessed available literature looking at complement gen genetic variants and determining their impact on relapse risk after ecoluzumab discontinuation. What you'll see is that patients that um, did not have a native kidney, so had a renal allograft, were of decreasing age, or who had um, variants in CFH or C3 or MCP, or at a higher risk for relapse. But those um, that did not have those um, parameters were at a low risk for relapse. So because of this data, what we've done at our institution is we are considering ecoluzumab or C5 inhibitor discontinuation um, in patients with complement-mediated TMA who have been in hematologic and renal remission for at least six months. Then what we're doing is we're saying, okay, let's look at their risk profile. Let's look back at those complement genetics and see if they have a high-risk variant or not. If they don't have a high-risk variant, then we do consider complement um, inhibitor discontinuation. If they do have a high-risk variant, then we counsel the patient. We say, you know, it may be too risky to consider complement inhibitor discontinuation. For those that we discontinue um, complement inhibitors, we watch them very closely with close lab and clinical follow-up. So now I'm going to give it over to Dr. Will Rich to discuss how we can use complement inhibitor therapy when patients are on complement inhibitors. Yeah, and I'll take just a minute here because I see that we are really close to time here. Um, but the, the idea is that if you remember the functional tests, they require the cascades to progress all the way to the end. Uh, and if you have a C5 inhibitor, that won't happen, right? So the expected outcome here is that uh, there will be no complement activity if you have eculizumab on board. So these tests can no longer be used as a diagnostic supportive criteria once a C5 inhibitor has been initiated. So now what we can do with these tests is monitor how well or how much of complement is being blocked by these drugs. So Dr. Sidram already covered this about the differences between eculizumab, the short-acting C5 inhibitor, and revolizumab. And we have two types of assays in the lab to help monitor these patients. One, we can offer the drug quantitation. The assays were not readily available. So I think in the United States, only two labs perform eculizumab and revolizumab testing. And we use a mass spectrometry approach for this. 
um, by measuring the signature light chain of, um, of the molecules. Um, so this is a very unique test that we offer. And pharmacodynamics, so we can measure the effects of complement, um, the effects of the drug on complement. And we suggest those functional tests. And what we realized after Revolizumab was uh, brought to the market is that they block or they, they work differently, right? So one is short acting, the other one is long acting. So here in this study, we started spiking Echilizumab in therapeutic concentrations in serum and we saw complement blockage. And we realized that these three tests could work to monitor complement blockage. When you reach therapeutic concentrations of Echilizumab of about 100, um, all three tests, C5 function, alternative pathway function, or complement, or classical pathway function, they're all blocked and could be used almost interchangeably. But for Ravalizumab, what we noticed is that only the age 50 was low and undetectable when the Ravalizumab therapeutic concentration was reached. So here we cannot use the C5 function and the CH50. And it's a specific to Revolizumab because it dissociates from C5 at low pH and the test uses low pH. So it's an analytical issue here. Uh, so because of this, we have different recommendations. If you want to monitor Revolizumab, we suggest uh, AH50 and we used to suggest and we still suggest C5 function um, for the Echilizumab monitoring panel. We plan on changing this to suggest AH50 and the drug concentration simultaneously for both assays to decrease confusing, confusion and facilitate ordering. That's all I had. Yeah. So I'm just gonna end just by showing how we use some of this um, testing clinically. Um, so what I have outlined in here is kind of the dosing protocol for ecolizumab. And based off of the clinical trials, we know that if you have ecolizumab trop levels of greater than 50, you achieve an adequate complement blockade. Um, so what we did is we checked complement trough levels um, in patients getting ecolizumab just by stern, standard dosing. And we saw that the majority of them, so nine out of 10 actually had levels that were very high. So definitely greater than 50. And so um, what we started doing is we started doing a personalized approach for ecolizumab um, dosing, where we um, increase the interval frequency of their maintenance doses um, to um, get closer to that 100 level. And so in doing that, um, we were able to extend ecolizumab frequency from every two weeks to every three to six weeks. And so there's many benefits of that. So the first one being that there's a decreased cost to the patient um, because um, they don't have to come in as frequently. Um, the other one is just, just the improvement of quality of life um, because they don't have to come in as frequently. So this is something that um, we are doing a standard practice for our patients on ecolizumab. Um, and so with that, Again, this has already kind of been mentioned, but we do have a multidisciplinary group here called the CAP TMA group. We meet once a month to uh, discuss um, TMA cases. Um, it involves members from nephrology, hematology, immunology, transfusion medicine, and lab medicine and pathology. And so with that, um, we are open for questions if there's times, and these are our acknowledgements. Thank you for participating. Please click the button below to complete the evaluation and obtain credit.